It is my great pleasure uh, to announce the last uh, and after dinner speaker of today, Professor Julia Yeomans. Um, she's a professor of physics at Oxford University, where she also graduated. And her graduation was on critical phenomena in disordered systems. She's doing mostly theoretical and computational work in uh, soft matter, statistical physics, and biophysics. She's uh, been distinguished by a variety of awards and prizes, and among others, she uh, is the recipient of the Pierre Gilles de Gennes uh, Lecture Prize. Uh, she's received an ERC Advance Grant, and she's a fellow of the Royal Society. Her research interest currently focuses mostly on complex fluids, such as uh, liquid crystals, but also uh, answering how fluids interact with structured surfaces. And I vividly remember the funny uh, uh, hovering pancake-shaped droplet uh, on a structured surface, which was the first talk I, I attended that she was giving. Today, she's going to talk about active matter, a really hot topic in uh, soft condensed matter, and I'm looking forward to her talk. So please welcome uh, Professor Julia Yeomans. Thanks, sir. Okay, so thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. This is obviously an amazing conference. And given that you've had lots of wine to drink, I hope that puts you in a very good mood. And I also hope that someone's going to save some for me after I've done this. I'm going to talk about active matter. And assuming this works, that doesn't work. Let's see if this one works. Okay, let me just say first thank you very much to the people who did the hard work. And in particular here, I'd like to acknowledge Christian Tyson, who is one of the locals, and we're lucky enough to have attracted to Oxford to do a PhD. So, what's active matter? Well, active systems are particles which take energy from the environment, and they take energy from the environment on a single particle level, and then they use it to do work. And often this is biological systems. We're all little engines. And the trouble is, if you look at big animals which are using energy to do work, life gets a bit complicated. Um, and so we tend to look at little things. We look at things like bacteria, and we look at molecular motors. And what these things do is that they're using chemistry using ATP, and they're using it to do work. So why is active matter interesting? I'm sure you must have heard of it. It's a big deal at the moment, and we'd all like to understand um, you know, why. Well, let's first of all think about bacteria. So these are some bacteria. That one's E. coli, and they're all sort of swimming around. And the sort of length scales we're at here is about 10 microns. So these are tiny things. And I grew up doing statistical physics, and so the sort of questions we ask is, what happens if you take these things and you put lots of them together? And this is a particularly interesting sort of statistical physics, because we all understand about Boltzmann's equation and equilibrium systems, but here we've got non-equilibrium systems. They're meant to exist out of equilibrium. They're meant to be taking energy and using it the whole time, because if they don't use energy, they're in a pretty bad way. So what happens? Let's take these swimmers. Let's put lots of them together. And the answer is that this happens. You get a structure which looks like turbulence. And that's a big puzzle, because we're at low Reynolds number here, pretty much zero Reynolds number. These things are tiny. And turbulence is meant to happen at very large Reynolds number. So you know, you get these chaotic sorts of flows. And why? What's going on here? Can we understand what's going on? So now let's move down a length scale. And if I move down a length scale, someone turn my sound on when it's not meant to be on. Right. OK. This is a molecular motor. The two feet are the molecular motor's bit. And what this molecular motor is doing is that it's moving chemicals around in a cell. And so in your body, 
are lots of things which look like this. It really is. I mean, I didn't believe it either the first time I saw it, but molecular motors actually do look pretty much like this. You have these feet which move along microtubules. So there's long, thin things there are microtubules, and this molecular motor is walking along it, and on its back is this sort of backpack that it's carrying around. You have to have this sort of transport in cells, and that's because if things were just diffusing around, they wouldn't get anywhere quickly enough, so you need some sort of directed transport, and you also have to have it with a track, like a train, it has to hang on to something, because these things are tiny. We're talking about tens of nanometers here, and so they'd just be buffeted around by Brownian motion, and they wouldn't get anywhere unless they had something to cling on to. The only thing a bit wrong with this animation is that this one is really rather good at it, and in fact, there'd be many more fluctuations, and the thing sort of manages to get forward most of the time, but sometimes by mistake, it also goes backwards. So these are the things which are making us move. These are the things which are doing the work of engines in our bodies. So there's a beautiful experimental system which was um, pioneered in Zvonimir Dodzik's lab two or three years ago now. And what he did is just take these, these microtubules, these long, thin microtubules, and the molecular motors. So the system basically consisted of microtubules and molecular motors. And the motors he used had two heads. So what they did is they bridged between the microtubules. So they bridged between the microtubules, and then what's going to happen if they start walking is if they walk in the same direction along a microtubule, nothing's going to happen. But if they walk in different directions, these microtubules are going to be pushed relative to each other. And this is an active system. You put in ATP, that's the chemistry. The motors essentially use the ATP to move, and they push the microtubules relative to each other. So let's take loads of these things and put them uh, on the surface and watch what happens. And this is um, a nice picture of what happens. This is from the group, the Barcelona group. And you can see the white strands there. Those white strands are the microtubules. And they're being pushed around by the molecular motors. And again, you get a state which looked like turbulence, which sort of looks like chaos. And it's not so different from what happened with the bacteria. What's going on? Can we understand what's going on here? And you can have macroscopic systems as well. Uh, the usual story is that people show starlings, which have beautiful vortical structures flying around all over the place. But I quite like this one. This one, I assume, is California. I assume that because of the surf borders. And I assume that's not a shark because of the surf borders. I think it's a dolphin. And that's a swarm of sardines, or similar. And this is especially because it's the Netherlands and you know about sea and things like that. And here's the dolphin. And you can see, you get these patterns. You get these patterns forming. They somehow are able to sense the dolphin at a distance. And then you get um, all these beautiful structures. There he goes. Why? What's going on? I will have no idea how to predict what's going on here. So that's the first reason for looking at these systems. It's collective motion, and it's collective motion out of equilibrium. They're beautiful experimental systems to try and write down theories of non-equilibrium statistical physics. But I think there's another reason for looking at these systems as well. And let's go back and just think about this one again, because it's a nice movie, so I like showing it. And, you know, these things are engines. They're incredibly complex engines. They can make us do all the things that we do. If we understood how to make these sorts of engines, how to use them, We'd be quids in, because they're about 
uh, 10 times as efficient as the internal combustion engine, and they may be small, but there are a lot of them. So a longer-term goal is to be able to engineer things on this sort of length scale. And nature is very good at that. What we've got here is these bacteria again, and they're things called the bacterial flagella motor, which sit just between the bacterium and its tail, and they turn, and as they turn, they make the flagellum move. So they're the bacteria, the, the, the motive for the bacterium. And the picture I've got up there is a sort of artist's impression of the best we can do at understanding these motors. Each of the little lumps of stuff there is a protein, and you can see that the proteins um, get together and form this motor. The motor goes across the membrane, and then you have this great big um, tail, this flagellum, which goes round and round. So this is tiny. It's about 20 nanometers across. And somehow, nature has to make it. All the parts are in the cell. They have to be put together. They have to be self-assembled in an incredibly complicated structure like this. This is just how one might think of doing it, but we really don't know how it's done. And it's very, very clever. And there's some wonderful work in the Netherlands self-assembling colloids, but I don't think anyone can quite manage this sort of level of complexity yet. And so there's an awful lot out there which we've got to understand. And if we can understand it, there'll be absolutely wonderful engineering that we can do with it. That's the big picture. It's going to take a lot of us a long time to understand what's going on here. I'm afraid I can only answer some questions um, which are much easier. So now I'm going to go back to worrying about the collective behavior of this active matter, and I'm going to talk to you about active turbulence. So first of all, I'll describe a little bit about the physics of active turbulence, and then I'll talk about two problems we've been thinking about. First of all, what happens if you take this active turbulence stuff and you put it in confinement, if you put it in a channel? And then I'm going to talk about um, some of the biological implications. And the way this talk has worked out, it's an awful lot about topological defects. Now, many of you know about topological defects. Certainly, the hard condensed matter people um, are, are very keen on topological phases at the moment. Astroparticle people, topological defects might be implicated in the early universe. Material scientists, dislocations are topological defects. And we didn't want to be left out, so it would be nice if we can find some topological defects in biology. And what I want to end up trying to convince you is, yes, you do find topological defects in biological systems, and maybe they have some sort of biological function. So there are going to be three bits. First of all, I'll explain as far as I know, the physics of active turbulence. We don't have a proper theory, but we sort of understand what's going on. And then those two other applications. So let me start by telling you what sort of topological defects I'm going to be talking about. They're going to be like the topological defects that we're used to in liquid crystals. Liquid crystals are long, thin molecules. And at low temperatures, they tend to line up with each other because then they have more space and it's untropically favorable for them to line up. And that forms a thing called the pneumatic phase. And the pneumatic phase has orientational order, but no positional order. And to describe the pneumatic symmetry, we use just a headless vector, which is called the director field, N. And we use... Um, sometimes a tensor, the tensor order parameter Q. And this tensor order parameter, its largest eigenvalue tells me the strength of the order, and its largest eigenvector tells me the direction of the order. 
And liquid crystals are fun things in the pneumatic phase because they're an elastic liquid. They're elastic because if you muck up the order by trying to splay it in some way or bend it in some way, it isn't happy. And so you get an extra energy and an elastic restoring force. And the other thing about them, which is nice, is that you get topological defects, places where the order goes wrong, where there's a singularity in the order, which actually have an infinite energy and an infinite system. And the two which are going to be important is that one on the left, left which looks like a comet, which is called a plus a half defect, and the one on the right, which is more symmetric, which is called a minus a half defect. So if you could remember the shapes, of those topological defects. And I know this is a bit much after dinner, but I'll just write down the equations. If you don't like them, just remember, this is just Navier-Stokes equations, but for a liquid crystal. This is the continuum equations of liquid crystals. They're written in terms of this liquid crystal order parameter, which is Q, the Q tensor, and you have first an advective term, and then a term which just says I've got a liquid crystal, and so if I have any shear flows, I'm going to turn my liquid crystal round. And then you have a second equation, which uh, is essentially the Navier-Stokes equation, and that big pi is the stress tensor, which has the usual viscous stress in it. Now, it turns out that if you want to write down the continuum equations of one of these active pneumatics, you just have to add one term to this. And the term you have to add is that one. It's a term proportional to Q, proportional to the order parameter. And that zeta in front of the Q is the strength of the order. And the point is that it comes under a derivative in the stress tensor. So that means every time the pneumatic order gets screwed up, you get a stress and you get flows happening. So I'm now going to spend just a couple of slides explaining why I've ended up describing these active systems in terms of this pneumatic order parameter Q. Because it's not obvious, is it? I mean, why has she done that? And the answer is actually Newton's equations of motion, Newton's laws about action and reaction. Because if I have a colloid and I pull it through a fluid, then I exert a force on it, and I pull it through a fluid, and I get a nice flow field, which is flowing like that. For the experts, that's the Stokeslet. But for these active systems, I'm not pulling it. I'm not moving it. It's moving itself. There's no external forces acting. And therefore, any force it puts on the fluid, it has to have an equal and opposite reaction. So it always puts forces on the fluid in pairs. And when I add up the flow field due to both of those pairs, what I'm going to get instead of this Stokeslet is a different pattern flow field, and you can see that it's one with pneumatic symmetry. There's a symmetry between the front of my swimmer and the back of my swimmer. So there's a rather nice connection between Newton's laws about action and reaction and the sort of equations you have to write down for these active systems. OK, so there I've got it. I've got this active term. It's in the stress tensor, and the punchline is, if you take your pneumatic ordering and you muck it up a bit, a small fluctuation mucks up the pneumatic ordering, that means that you get stress and you get flows, and you can work it out that that just mucks up the pneumatic ordering even more. And so my pneumatic state is unstable the minute you put these active forces on. You can't have a pneumatic state with flow being stable. It crosses over to something else. What does it cross over to? 
what happens instead? And the answer is this active turbulence. So this is a pneumatic, but it's a pneumatic which is being turbulent because of this extra energy, this extra stress that we're putting into the system. What turns out to be important in this active turbulence is the vorticity. So what I put on the right of that screen there is the vorticity field. And the vorticity is how much the fluid is moving in one direction or moving in the other direction. And the red bits, it's moving clockwise, and the blue bits, it's moving anti-clockwise. And this vorticity plot is very um, indicative of this active turbulent state. And the vortices are maybe about 10 um, bacterial lengths across. So let's see if we can get that if we take the equations and we solve them on a computer. So this is the result of solving the equations. Great, looks right. You get the same plot of vorticity. And let's take a, play, a, a little bit like that and let's sort of just look. Let's magnify it and see what's going on. And if you magnify it and see what's going on, what you can see in this right-hand picture here is that you get a bend in stability in the liquid crystal. You get the liquid crystal um, molecules are bent round like that. That gives you stress, and so it gives you a flow, and that's the flow which is driving this active turbulence. So it's a pneumatic. So it's a pneumatic, so they're meant to be topological defects. So, so let's look at those topological defects. Let's look at the plus a half and minus a half topological defects in this active system. So red ones are plus a half and the blue ones are minus a half. And OK, what do you expect? Well, in a passive system, they act like charges and they annihilate each other and they cancel each other out. And so what happens is that they all happily annihilate, and you end up with a perfect pneumatic. So let's have a look what happens in these active systems. Now, I'm not allowed to point with this strange screen, so you have to look very carefully, and you'll see in the middle there, two um, cancelling each other out and annihilating with each other. But if you look at the top right, you'll see they also appear. The activity, let me play that one again, the activity is making the defects move. The defects are motile, particularly the plus a half defects are motile. So when a fluctuation creates them, they're not destroyed immediately, but they move away from each other. And then they move around till they find another one of the opposite charge and then they annihilate, and you end up with a gas of plus and minus a half topological defects. And it makes a lot of, lot of sense that they move, because they're places where the director field has a lot of, um, a lot of gradient. They're huge gradients in the director field near a defect, and so they're big stresses, and so they're lots of flows. And the plus a half ones move quite quickly, and the minus a half ones move less quickly just because of the symmetry, and so the stresses tend to balance because of that threefold symmetry. So, topological defects and self motile topological defects are a real signature of this active turbulence. So, Let's look at the experiments. Let's look at this system where you have, um, these, these are the microtubules and the molecular motors, and the green dots are the plus a half topological defects. And there they are moving around, being motile. So, active systems. What's new about them is topological defects and particular movable, motile topological defects. Now, if one day 
we want to use this stuff and we want to use it as an engine, it would be much better if it wasn't just being turbulent and moving around all over the place. It would be much better if you could get the flows to be coherent and to move happily in just one direction. And one way to do that is actually to take the active stuff and to confine it in a microchannel, or because we're theorists, in just a 2D microchannel. So what happens if I take my active material and I put it in a microchannel? So the x-axis is increasing the activity. And as you increase the activity, you go from a green bit where nothing's moving to a blue bit where you start getting laminar flow. And then you get the purple bit where the laminar flow starts oscillating. And then you get the gray bit where you get vortices. And then you get the yellow bit which is turbulent. This is a picture saying the same thing. Okay, you start off with nice laminar flows. The color is vorticity. The thing gets um, a bit more random. You start getting oscillations on your laminar flows. And then in the bottom left-hand corner, you get this state where you get opposing vortices. It's a bit like Rayleigh-Bernard convection with vortices going in opposite directions, and then you get a state which is turbulent. So let's concentrate on that vortex state for a start. Let's have a look a bit more at a bit, and, and um, that again shows these opposing vortices. And it sort of makes sense that you get this, because You've got a length scale here, which is the length scale of the vortices the fluid likes to have. And at the same time, you have a length scale, which is the size of the channel. And it's when those more or less match that you get this state. And in this state, what happens to the topological defects? Well, the minus ones are the pink dots, and they just sit at the edge of the channel, and they don't go anywhere. But the plus ones do a nice dance. The plus ones, half of them move like this, and the other half move in the other direction like that. So let me show you on a movie. On the bottom movie, those green dots are the plus a half topological defects, and they move around the vortices like this. And so we called this state a Cayley dance. Then I realized that nobody who didn't live in the UK, or at least usually in Scotland, had a clue what a Cayley dance was. It's a real favorite for both Cayley and Scottish country dancers. The first couple turn by the right hand at the top, usually a barrel at Cayley's. The first lady turns second man left hand, her partner right hand, working her way down the line of men and turning her partner in between. Okay, so for dancers, the think man defects. Then dances up the lady's side, turning them by the left hand. Pa okay, so that's exactly what the defects are doing in this material. And I have to say, we thought, oh, this is very pretty. We theorists are playing. But then Francesc Saguez, in his amazing experiments, looked for this Cayley dance and found this. This is very hot off the press. Those are the topological defects, and that works beautifully. And this was essentially the first experiment that he did. But then he tried to make his experiments a bit more perfect, because what happened here is that the barriers were busy sinking. And of course, it never works so nicely again. And what they're seeing at the moment is that you tend to get defects which come in from the side of the channel, as well as the dancing defects in the middle. And we don't understand whether that's due to um, roughness, any sort of disorder on the size of the channel, or whether it's due to possibly uh, being in a slightly different regime in the experiment. So that's really new stuff which is ongoing, which we're trying to 
understand. Okay, so what I want to do now is move on to the second story and think about real biological systems and say, okay, biological systems are active systems. Active systems have topological defects. Is there anything we can do with topological defects in biological systems? And what made us think there might be are pictures like this. This one is a layer of epithelial cells. So that's what you've got inside you, lining most of your organs. And that looks like it's turbulent, sort of. At least it's active. Those white blobs are, um, the white blobs are cells which pop out of the layer as it gets more crowded. So that sort of might look the same. This one here is bacteria, and the bacteria are busy dividing. And right in the middle of that, sort of, um, yeah, pretty much in the middle, there's a little triangle, and that's a topological defect. So you certainly see topological defects there. And then the colored picture is a picture from Lena Odisheda's group where they looked at the vorticity field around a dividing cell. So it wasn't just one cell, it was lots of cells, and then they lined up the data so that the cell was always dividing in the same direction. And they measured the vorticity field, and you can see this vortex pattern very nicely. So, you know, this cell is creating a flow field, and it's creating a flow field with vorticity. That pattern takes minutes to form. It's low Reynolds number. It really is totally counterintuitive, but you can measure the pattern. So let's start by thinking about bacteria, because bacteria look like a nomatic. They're nomatic twice, if you like. The flow field that they produce has this nomatic symmetry, but they're also long, thin rods, and so um, they're nomatic in shape. So these things are ever so nomadic. So um, an absolutely superb graduate student who is a biologist by training, but is also a brilliant physicist, Oliver Meacock at Oxford, looked at pseudomonas, looked at them moving around, and looked at the defects, the ones with arrows are plus a half defects, and the ones, uh, the other ones, the blue ones, are minus a half defects. And using a tracking program, you can see defects in this sort of system. He then did a sort of simulation, which is different from the ones I've been talking about so far, because so far I've talked about solving the continuum equations. He did a simulation, and his simulation was just rods. So it's just self-propelled rods moving around with an interaction, which means they can't cross each other. And to make them nomadic, they reverse direction every now and then. And he put in the same parameters as this pseudomonas, and you see essentially exactly the same thing. You see plus a half defects moving around, and you see minus a half defects moving around less quickly. Now, at this point, particularly for a supervisor, you say, so what? You know, it's nice pictures. So that, what can we measure? What can we measure to see if these things are the same? So we thought it would be sensible to measure the flow fields. We can measure the flow fields around these topological defects in the continuum simulations, in these rod simulations, and in the experiments. Okay? The one on the right is the flow field um, around uh, using the continuum simulations. At the top, it's a minus a half defect. There you've got that six-fold symmetry. And at the bottom, it's a plus a half defect, and you get a net propulsion to the right. Those are easy to see because in the continuum simulation, there's no noise. 
Next one along is the Rods model. Again, you can see exactly the same six-fold symmetry for the minus a half defect and something moving to the right for the plus a half defect. And then this one here at the end, K okay, at the top, you get the um, minus a half. Again, you can pretty much see the six-fold symmetry, but there are many. These are hard experiments. Okay, but you see that these match beautifully, that the velocity field matches in the three cases. So that gives, I think, reasonably strong evidence that we can interpret what's going on in Pseudomonas as being um, plus and minus a half topological defects. What I don't understand is why the Rod model works. Because I would have expected that in the Rod model, there's no hydrodynamics, there's no implicit flow in there. And I'm used to thinking of these things as being a consequence of hydrodynamic models. And so I think there are puzzles about why you get the same sort of defects with the same sort of velocity fields in the discrete model and in the model where we put in hydrodynamic equations. Another question to be answered. Okay, so, but those things were pretty pneumatic. I mean, they were long, thin, and rod-like. What about um, these sorts of cells, these epithelial cells? Move. Yeah. Oh, it's getting too late at night. OK, so in theory, these things, let's see if they'll do it, all right. These things are cells. We saw what was happening before we saw that, yeah, these things move around. Again, these are active systems. There are actually two sorts of activity. Activity because they're moving, and also activity because they're dividing, because we saw that the division uh, created flow fields. Can we map these onto one of these active pneumatic models? So somehow we have to take the cells and map them onto a pneumatic. And we thought perhaps the best way to do it was just to take a little group of cells, and if they're elongated in a certain direction, say that's the direction of the pneumatic director. When the cells aren't moving, they won't be elongated, but cells that move tend to be elongated in a particular direction, and so you can define a pneumatic director. I don't know if this is the best way to do it, but it's a good start. And when you do it, you can identify topological defects. This is a plus one, plus a half one, and it's doing what plus a half is meant to do. It's moving around. Okay, so again, you need to check something, and what we did is we checked the stress field around that defect. We checked the stress field around a topological defect, essentially the pressure in the experiment and the simulations, and we compared it for a plus a half defect and for a minus a half defect, and it just matched beautifully. And so I think that's nice evidence that thinking of these things as defects is quite an interesting thing to do. And this is an experiment which I think shows very nicely how one can think of these cell layers as active systems. What this is, is the number of topological defects as a function of time. And at time t equals zero, the biologists add blebistatin to the cells. And what blebistatin does is it sends the cells to sleep. And so essentially the active pneumatic becomes passive, and the number of topological defects decreases because they annihilate each other but no new ones are formed. And then at time 600, what they do is they wash out the blebistatin. Essentially, you know, it's like an alarm clock for cells. They wake it up. And what happens is the number of defects increases again. So it is activity which is creating these topological defects. So is there any 
biological relevance of having topological defects in these cellular systems. Well, what we found is that the places where the cells died and were pushed out of the layers was strongly correlated to the positions of the defects. So it looked as if somehow these topological defects were killing the cells. Certainly, my first thought was topological defects are places where there's a large amount of stress, and so the cells are getting squashed, and they're miserable, and so they die and pop out of the layers. However, my clever biologist colleagues have proved that it's um, more than that, and this is Benrat Ladu in Paris and Thuan Ben Saw in Singapore. What happens is that the topological defects subject the cells to stress that moves a chemical called YAP. They have funny names, these biology chemicals. YAP moves from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. The stress makes it move from nucleus to cytoplasm, and that is a signal for cell death. And so it is the stress, but it's stressed via a chemical pathway which kills these cells, and then they pop out of the layers. So, it does look like there is a link between the topological defects and uh, homeostasis, the way in which these cells um, keep, uh, where which cells die, so you end up with the right number of cells in a layer. So, this is what I just said. And I think thinking of Biological systems as active matter is a new way of looking at them. It's not going to answer all questions, but maybe it's going to answer some questions about cell mechanics. So, let me um, stop there and finish with what I started with. Assuming it lets me. Oh. Yeah, that's what I want. Because I think this really is the big picture. Nature is very good at making tiny engines. It can assemble them, and then it can use them to do very complicated tasks. We can't yet, and there's a lot of great science to be done to try and find out how to do this. Thank you very much.